Hello and welcome to What the Folk Travel Podcast. This is Series 3, Episode 7, and this one's all about Luxembourg. Radio Luxembourg. Hello. Thank you for joining us, guys, for another episode of What the Folk Travel Podcast. This time we're going to be talking about a country that me and Amy have not been to, and that is Luxembourg. Now, here to help us to decide whether this episode is going to be all filler or all killer is James from the Bottomless Pit podcast. Thank you very much. It's great to be here, and that's a lot of pressure you've put on me there. Yeah, this whole show just basically rests on your shoulders, because me and Amy have not <laughs> been. And I think what we said before, Amy, this will be a good chance to see really if after the show, do we feel like we want to go. Is Luxembourg worth a visit? Yeah, absolutely. So no pressure at all. But I've never really been that drawn to go into Luxembourg. I mean, before we started the episode, I called it Liechtenstein. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. But yeah, no pressure because by the end of it, we're going to actually see if we want to go or not. Lovely. Well, to be honest with you, I think it's one of those countries that most people do just kind of look over, you know, when looking for somewhere to go in Europe, they think of Germany, France, you know, the bigger more popular countries in Luxembourg is kind of almost like a flyover place. Yeah, and obviously we'll get into it later, but what are the countries that surround Luxembourg then? Oh, you're testing me now. So we got France, Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands, I believe, also borders it, although I'm not sure. Your girlfriend is giving you a bit of a look. It might not be the <laughs> Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> but that's kind of the general, like, where it is. This episode is sponsored by Storyteller, the travel accessories company that helps provide access to a quality education for individuals in less privileged areas of the world. Okay, so before we get started, let's go with some shout outs, Nick. So starting with the guys from the GHT Overland podcast, they got in touch on Instagram. They said that they've been binge listing the show. So thank you so much. We also heard from Sarah Blinko on Instagram. She said she's off to Ibiza soon. Actually, by the time this comes out, she would have already been back. But she listened to our Ibiza episode and she said thanks for all the advice. So we hope you had a good time. We also heard from Stephen Hansen on Instagram, said that he loves the show and he listened to all of our episodes in like a week. That's quite a lot of episodes to listen to in a week. And finally, Aaron Smith on Instagram said that he loves the show, but in particular, he liked our two mini episodes, the first one with Dave Cornthwaite and then also Nick Thompson, the cyclist. They were both like inspirational guests, weren't they? So Aaron, thank you so much for getting in touch. And that's it for this month. Okay, so on this episode, we will be testing James on the Capitals game. Of course, we have Game Show Facts as well on Luxembourg. We talk about the Luxembourgish language, the food, its World War II history and their royal family in a test to see if James can convince us to make our way to Luxembourg. And of course, it wouldn't be a What the Foe episode unless we play a game. This month's game is called The Bottomless Pit, where we challenge each other to talk for a whole minute of a chosen subject. So James, I know you're excited about this. We're going to be doing the Capitals game. Have you been preparing yourself for this? I have not prepared myself for the Capitals game because I wanted to just see how good I really was without having to study for this. Okay, and what's kind of your area of speciality, do you think? I'll be disappointed if I'm not hot on the European or, or American Capitals. But if it comes to Africa and Asia, then you might see me struggle. Okay, okay. So if you haven't heard this game before, it's called the Capitals Game. You have 30 seconds. I'm going to give you countries and you have to give me the capital city of that country. You have 30 seconds and three, two, one. Venezuela. Caracas. Spain. Madrid. Croatia. Zagreb. Iceland. Reykjavik. Kenya. Uh... Nairobi. Malaysia. Jakarta. Australia. Canberra. Taiwan. Don't know. Colombia. Bogota. Chile. Santiago. The US of A. Washington DC. Egypt. Cairo. Ukraine. Uh, oh, Kiev. Oh, time's up. You still got it. <laughs> Did you get it in time? I'm sorry, James. Oh. You are out of time. Only just on Kia. We have to be fair to all of our past yeah. guests. Um, but let's run through them. You did very well. And actually, I was sweating because we got to the end of the list. <laughs> yeah, I was <laughs> That's a good sign. So, Venezuela, correct. Caracas, Spain, Madrid, yes. Croatia, Zagreb, yes. Iceland, Reykjavik, yep. Kenya, you struggled a bit, but you got there. Nairobi, Malaysia. I think a lot of people will be shouting at their... 
podcast devices right now. Kuala Lumpur. Yeah, KL in other words. Yeah, Kuala Lumpur from Malaysia. I think you said Jakarta. Yeah. Australia, Canberra, correct. Taiwan is Taipei. You got that wrong. Oh, you didn't know it. Yeah. Colombia is Bogota. You got that right. Chile, Santiago. You got that right. USA, Washington, D.C. You got that right. Egypt, Cairo. You got that correct. And you did get Ukraine correct with Kiev, but you were out of time. So that means you got 10. And that is one of our best scores. So well done. Yeah, I think that's quite close to uh, Richard, who did our Australia episode, who I don't know whether, whether you heard, but he kept watching a YouTube video and just kept listening and listening and listening. And so it's kind of ingrained in his head, which is a very good tactic. Yeah, honestly, you've done really well. Yeah, I think you probably finished second. Actually, when we first started this podcast, I got 10. So you've equaled my score. But yeah, Richard is the champion. He got like 13, which is ridiculous. I'm happy to take my place in the near the top. Wow, very impressed. Very impressed. Right, so Nick, the next feature that we've got coming up is Game Show Facts. Tell us something about Luxembourg. Because all I kind of know about this country is being a bit of a radio buff because I work in radio is... Uh, Radio Luxembourg is very big. It's kind of where a lot of big UK presenters kind of cut their teeth, especially Chris Moyles, if anyone out there knows him. So for me, it just kind of reminds me of Radio Land, really. And that's all I know. So I'm interested to find out some more. Well, you're taking my facts. So <laughs> can you stop talking now? Okay, Luxembourg facts. Music make you lose control. Luxembourg, a small country landlocked by Belgium, France and Germany, not the Netherlands. Many of its inhabitants are trilingual in French, German and Luxembourgish. The population is around half a million and the capital city is Luxembourg. Luxembourg's prosperity was formerly based on steel manufacturing. With the decline of that industry, Luxembourg diversified and is now best known for its status as Europe's most powerful investment management centre. Per population, Luxembourg and Qatar battle it out as the richest countries in the world. Luxembourg has a long tradition of operating radio and TV services for European audiences. Generations of British listeners grew up with Radio Luxembourg, which beamed pop music programmes into the UK. It closed down in 1992, but at one point it was the biggest commercial radio station in Europe. Many well-known DJs working at Radio Luxembourg include Chris Moyles. Nearly 40% of the population of Luxembourg are immigrants. 15% of them are of Portuguese origin. Nearly half of Luxembourg's workforce commutes to work in Luxembourg from another country every day. According to a UN survey, you have less chance of being shot in Luxembourg than in any other country in the world. Nice facts. Thanks, Nick. Um, so the one that surprised me this time was the richest per population fact. That's crazy. So they're the richest. Well, yeah. And yeah, per population, because they're a small country. So, you know, like somewhere like the States would have a bigger economy and more money, but they've got a lot more people. But yeah, I always knew it was a, a well-off place, Luxembourg. But yeah, per population, one of the richest in the world. Do you, could you notice that when you were there? Like, is it actually expensive, to, uh, James, to, like, to buy food and things there? Yeah, absolutely. The quality of living is very, very high. But then, of course, coming with that are the costs. You know, rents, rent prices are through the roof. Um, however, it's a tax haven. So things like buying petrol, which in the UK is very expensive, there's no tax on the petrol there. And so it's super cheap. You also mentioned about that almost half of the population are, are not native Luxembourgers. And you get so many people from the surrounding countries that come into Luxembourg to work because they earn so much more money in Luxembourg because it's so rich. So they can live in Germany, France, Belgium for, let's say, average prices, but earn a load of money in Luxembourg and then go home at the end of the day. Yeah, because that's strange for us where we live in the UK, living on an island. But I mean, this does happen all across Europe. I remember when we were in Bratislava in Slovakia, that's very close to the Austrian border. And we were told that loads of Slovaks every day go to Austria to work. And to us, that just sounds crazy commuting to another country. But I guess it's, it's quite common in these places in Europe where countries have borders with each other. Let's move on to talk about the language, because that's one of my favourite things when I travel, learning about the language. And we had a little bit of a chat before we clicked record on this episode. And you were telling me that the language is Luxembourgish. Is that's that right? right? Yeah, that's right. It doesn't sound like a real language, but I swear no, it is. I thought you were making it up. <laughs> it's just kind of like a pet name that you call it yourself. So you were saying it's a bit of a mix kind of between French and German? Yeah, I think officially it's a kind of dialect of German. It's certainly 
has a lot more related to that language than it does to French, but they also do mix in French words like merci for thank you and that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. So I did some Googling on Google Translate. Obviously, like we said, we haven't been there before. But yeah, thank you is merci. And how are you is similar to German, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's right. So it's something, I don't speak Luxembourgish, but I do speak German. So it's something like, wie geht es dir? Yeah, that's it. That's what it says on my screen here. So I'm going to go with that. You've got a better accent than me. <laughs> and of course, one that you've always got to know is cheers, which is Prost, is, which is the same as German. That's the same as German, exactly. Yeah, but I'm saying it wrong, aren't I? No, no, that's very good. Oh. So Prost would be Prost. with the accent, but that's yeah. basically right. Yeah. And I think it's that in other languages as well. I think where we went in like Iceland and stuff, wasn't it the same? Um, I don't know about Iceland. I know Nostravia is cheers in a few countries, I think. But I, so I wanted to know, speaking German, could you get by in Luxembourg with just German? It was a weird one. It depended who you met on the street. Like you said in your game show facts, there are so many people in Luxembourg who aren't Luxembourgish themselves. So if you walk up to people, the majority of them are actually native French speakers, being from France or Belgium. And so if you walk up to them and speak German, then it's a bit of an issue. But if you walk up to a German or a native Luxembourger, then you can get by with German, absolutely. But to be safe, English is going to get you by with everybody. So your girlfriend, Melissa, is in the room and she is German herself. You were saying that you can understand German, can't you? Uh, not understand German. <laughs> wow. You can understand Luxembourgish. So for example, when you're listening to the radio, as long as it's slow, you can understand it. Yeah, I can kind of guess what they're talking about. It's not like English or German, but I kind of can guess the topic. Mm. Can you understand Scottish people? <laughs> um, yeah, in Edinburgh was all right. In Glasgow was a bit more of a challenge, but Scottish people... Um, I, I was in England for a few months before I went to Scotland. I think if I went to Scotland without living in England before that, that would have been an issue, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. So James, let's get into it. So first of all, why Luxembourg? Why were you living there? I was living there because I'm currently studying for a PhD in England, but part of my research just happened to take me over there. There was a research group that were doing something in the area that I was, and they have a lot more of the expertise and the equipment than I do. And so I was able to go over there and live there for six months. So what language was your course in then? My course, well, it's a PhD, so it's research rather than a course itself. So I was just going over there to conduct research and I was working with a mix of people. So there were a couple of Luxembourgers, there was a couple of Germans, there was a guy from Cameroon, so he's a French speaker. And it was a real mixture of people there. It was great. It was really, really good. Okay. So, yeah, six months you were living there. So when you were there, yeah, did you did you struggle with, like we said, the expense of the place? I mean, rent and buying things? Because I'm assuming a lot of people that live and work there are bankers. Is that right to assume that? Or a lot of people are? I think that's the stereotype of the country. So, yeah, did you feel like you could still have a good like standard of life? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly the stereotype of the country. And obviously all the big corporations have the headquarters there, Google, Amazon, and big pharmaceutical companies as well. So yeah, a lot of people are involved with those. As far as rent's concerned, it is high. So if you're going to live there, then you need to be working there as well. You know, you couldn't work in a neighboring country and live in Luxembourg very easily. But to travel through there, you could, you know, things like couch surfing, Airbnb, make seeing this country very affordable. And it's absolutely somewhere worth seeing. So what were your first impressions of the country? Because whenever I enter a country, I normally get a feel of it. So, you know, this is, it feels like a mix of Italy and Greece put together or whatever. So what was your first impression? I actually had been to Luxembourg before I moved there. I'd spent 24 hours there as I was hitchhiking from Amsterdam back to Germany, where I used to live. And I couch surfed there for one night. So that was my first impression of the country. And it seemed like this ancient land built on two levels because the city is kind of spread amongst mountains and valleys. And there are actually uh, lifts or elevators that go from the top level to the bottom level. And they're just free for public use. And one of them is a glass lift, so you get a beautiful panoramic view of the whole surrounding valleys and everything. Obviously, it's, it's, got, it's Europe. It's got a lot of history. It's got a lot of old ancient buildings, castles and stuff, loads of World War II history, if that's what you're into. And I just got the impression that it's clearly very rich, very well off, but the people are very open. It's so multicultural there. It's, so, it's such a mix of, of people. You mentioned uh, even 15% Portuguese. That's the biggest Portuguese population outside of Portugal. And the reason for that is, again, going back to your game show facts, because of the steel industry, when Luxembourg was building its money up based on steel, they got immigrant workers to do that, that work and they got them all to come in from Portugal. And now those guys stayed here or stayed there once Luxembourg changed its industry from steel to banking and that kind of thing. 
Yeah, it's very interesting, isn't it? A bit like when we were in Brazil and we learned that they've got the biggest population of Japanese people outside of Japan and you, you wouldn't put these two countries together. So could you see a lot of the Portuguese influence on like culture or even architecture, things like that, or not really? Not too much, but that might just be me because I wasn't particularly aware of it when I first arrived and that wasn't my, the reason for me being there. You can certainly see who are the Portuguese, either immigrants or sons of Portuguese, sons and daughters of Portuguese immigrants because they've got more tanned skin, you know? Um, and you can hear them speaking Portuguese. You know, you, that's, that is a language you will hear in amongst the French, the German and the Luxembourgish on the streets. Interesting. So what is there to do in Luxembourg if we were just there for the weekend? You know, what, what are the tourist attractions? As I say, it's a very historical city or very historical country. One of the best things about it, in fact, is the public transport there is incredibly cheap. So just to give you an idea, it costs two euros for a single ticket, but that's for a single ticket, not just on the buses within the city, but on the buses and trains for in the whole country. And a day ticket is four euros for the whole country, unlimited wow. travel. That's incredible because to think, so we're in Chelmsford now, for us to go to our next town along, which maybe would be Hatfield Peveril I think it would cost us five pounds one way and that's only a few a matter of a few miles and it would cost us maybe 200 quid to get to the other side of the country and we're just the UK we're probably just as small no uh, no because yeah Luxembourg is like a really small country so I wanted to ask outside of wait, like is it Luxembourg city outside of the city itself is there anything else to see in the country or does the country just finish <laughs> beyond the city limits <laughs> No, there's plenty there. There's lots of little towns and villages and stuff. So Luxembourg City, the capital, is the big city. It's where most of the population live. But going out into the country, you know, you've got... It's the Ardennes, you know, kind of spilling into, into Belgium. It's beautiful landscape there. There's plenty of World War II stuff to see, particularly if you... Have you seen the, the, the show The Band of Brothers? No. No? It, I'm sure plenty of your listeners have done it. It was a very popular TV series uh, set around the end of the World War II period and that entire thing takes place around the borders of Luxembourg and because that's where the final main battle of World War II happened when the Americans and everyone left they left all their stuff there their tanks their guns their vehicles their equipment everything and it's all been gathered up and put into various museums around the country and there's one particularly that used to be a brewery actually and one of the scenes from this TV series Band of Brothers is set around the events that happened around this brewery where an American platoon got bunkered down in the in the basement of it and were sort of taking fire for, for days on end. And now this brewery has been turned into this massive museum for everything to do with the world with World War Two. It's really, really interesting stuff if that's what you like. That's really interesting. And so a lot of Americans, when they come over, they love coming to Europe because we have such a rich history and there's so much to do here. So would you say Luxembourg kind of rivals England and France in terms of their history? Is it still worth them making their way to Luxembourg as well? A hundred percent. I mean, Luxembourg, because it's so small, it's got an interesting history as far as what Luxembourg was over the years. It used to be owned by France. It used to be owned by Belgium. In fact, if you drive over the border from Luxembourg into Belgium, the first province in Belgium is also called Luxembourg, for example. And so it's sort of changed hands between all these different countries at various times in history. And, and because of that, it has this wicked mix of culture and lots of different stuff going on. So there's plenty for people going there. Cool. So you mentioned like mixes of culture and stuff like that. But I want to know what is something that is really Luxembourgish like what's something that you can think oh that is that is so Luxembourgish <laughs> is there something that comes to mind something they do or something that people say because I imagine it's just very French and German you know just a mixture of those countries yeah I mean I don't want to offend any Luxembourgers listening but I get that impression as well it's very French and German mixed the Luxemburger native Luxembourgers are very proud to be from Luxembourg you, you know you would offend them if you equated them to a Frenchman or a German you know but from with outside eyes looking in, it looks just like it could be attached to any of these countries. And I think that is partly because it used to be part of many of these countries surrounding it, you know. And is it the same for the food? So obviously croissants are very French. <laughs> I'm sure you can get all of that there. And then also a lot of German food. Is it kind of mixed as well? Yeah, meat and potatoes kind of stuff. You know, it's, it's your standard stodgy, heavy food. Lovely, you know, but that, because of the Portuguese influence, you will also find lo lovely Portuguese restaurants around if that's more your thing. So there really is something for everyone.
So if uh, if someone did want to visit, do you think like a weekend's fine or a week? Like yeah, realistically, just because uh, I know you lived there for six months, but if someone just wanted to go and check out the place, how long would you recommend someone was there for? You could do it in a weekend, particularly because it, most of the stuff is in the main city, in the capital. You certainly could have a weekend away, see most of the things. You know, if you're interested in the history, there's tons of it in the city centre. If you're interested in World War Two, particularly, as I say, you can get a day ticket for four euros, get a train for half an hour, you're out in the country, you can go to these museums. Uh, Schengen, which is the agreement that allows free travel across Europe in the EU, that's the agreement that was written there, was written in the town of Schengen in Luxembourg, which is on the border of Luxembourg, Germany and France. Oh, wow. Uh, so you can literally visit three countries within a space of 10 minutes or so by by foot. Yeah. And so you can do, but you can do all these things within a day. You know, you really could do it in a weekend. So you don't necessarily have to say, all right, I'm going for a week to Luxembourg. It could be, I'm going to Germany or I'm going to Poland on holiday, but we'll stop in Luxembourg for a couple of days on the way. Yeah, that's good. That's part of the appeal. It's good that you can do all this stuff and see the whole country in just a few days. One of the things I didn't like about Australia is that it's too big. (laughs) It's just too big. You know, if you want to see it all, forget it. It's like going around Europe, really. Um, But you were speaking of how the free movement around Europe, what was the thing they signed? Did you say it was called? The Schengen Agreement. Yeah, I just find that funny because we're talking about how you know almost half the population commute in every day it's got all these influences from portugal france germany people here in the uk like of an older generation they're paranoid about this free movement around europe aren't they they should listen to this and hear about luxembourg because they would freak out they're probably thinking how does society function i know it's crazy and it's one of those things as well i think particularly and i'm sure you guys agree being from an island you know being from the uk it still blows my mind when I'm in, on mainland Europe and I go to a train station or something and you, you're in, let's say, Luxembourg and you go to the train station and you can get a train to Prague, to Brussels, to Paris, to Berlin, to Vienna. All these destinations that seem so far away or just they're, they're in different countries because for us, we have to get on a boat or a plane to leave. But you can just hop on a train and you're there. It's easy. Yeah, and like the the train station. Yeah, like um, they, they treat these destinations as cities rather than, so, yeah, like you said, to get the train to Prague. It doesn't say get the train to Czech Republic, does it? It's just like, yeah, it's just another European city. Like, why not? And everyone can move around freely. And I really like it. I think it's great. It's one of the good things about Europe. You think you have to go quite far east if you're driving and two, you have to show your passport, I think. I don't know what country that would be. I think it's all the way to like Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, those kind of countries there, yeah. So you've mentioned already that there's a strong link with World War II. So I'm guessing there's sites that you can go to in Luxembourg? Sites might be the wrong word. There's a couple of military cemeteries okay. there. So the ones I'll give the examples of are the American, the US military cemetery and the German military cemetery, because those are the most kind of hard hitting, I would say. I went first to the American military cemetery. There, there are the gravestones of 10,000 soldiers there. Wow. And each soldier has his own grave with a, a marble cross. Like you can imagine when you think of these big military cemetery type things from World War Two. I think I've been to one in Belgium. I went for a school trip. So that's kind of, yeah, similar yeah. to what I'm imagining. Yeah, exactly. And it looks exactly like that, what you see in the pictures and, and all that kind of stuff. And it's very clean. It's obviously very well tended to and very looked after. But I think because it's American soldiers and America's so far away, there aren't too many people that come to visit the graves because it's their relatives and that kind of thing it's very much a tourist attraction whereas the german military cemetery which is less than a mile down the road was a very different story so first of all it's there's no big marble crosses for each soldier and stuff there's the same amount of soldiers in this german cemetery ten thousand or so four thousand are spread across the grass and each of them have got like a just a kind of brown stone cross but there might be two or three soldiers to one grave rather than having one per soldier. And then at the back of the graveyard, there's a massive cross. It may be 20 feet high or so, again, made out of stone. And that's to symbolize a mass grave of 4,000 German soldiers. Oh my God. And one of the things I found more poignant about it, because obviously we're right on the border of Germany here, Luxembourg's tiny country, some of the graves have flowers and wreaths and, and vases and that kind of stuff by them because... Although you don't, although these people were the baddies, if you, you know, if you think about it like that, these guys were fighting for the Nazis, their relatives are still around today. They, 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 that was still somebody's uh, father and grandfather. And, and so people still want to come and 
visit and pay their respects to the graves you know it's true it must they must be in a, a weird limbo land in terms of they want to mourn that person but also they well there will be circumstances where they completely disagree with what they were fighting for yeah. so yeah that must be a really weird situation i've never thought about the war in in that sense really i hadn't either before i went now i was just kind of sitting in my room in luxembourg in my first week looking at what to do in luxembourg because like you guys i never really heard much about it i didn't really know what there was to do there and the top top thing to do on TripAdvisor, I think it was, was the US military cemetery. The German military cemetery doesn't appear. See, now I think that's more interesting though. That's the one I would rather go to because, well, I kind of like dark tourism really. Um, and I think that's, that's the side that I've never heard before. I've heard our side. I've been to Auschwitz and, and seen all of kind of, yeah, like you say, the baddie and the, the goody side, I've seen that. Um, but I would like to see it from the German side. So that's really interesting. So it seems like, well, as we've spoken, we now know that it has such strong links to Germany and France and all of that and how it's quite mixed. Why do you think Luxembourg isn't as popular then? Why do we not know that much about Luxembourg and why aren't there that many tourists there? It's a good question. It's one of those things where I think we all know roughly what Luxembourg is. You know, you said your impression of it was it's a bank haven, that kind of stuff. And you think as a tourist or a traveller, you think, well, I don't need to go see that particularly I don't need to go see loads of banks. And although, so as soon as I came back from Luxembourg, all of a sudden I couldn't stop seeing Luxembourg in the media. It was one of those things where as soon as you're aware of it, you start seeing it everywhere. And I think it's just one of those countries because it's so small, because you just think of banks, you don't really think about what else is there to see and to do there. And if you do go there, it's a, it's a undervisited country with loads to offer. So you would definitely recommend someone go there? 100%. Good to hear. Right, so we're going to take a little break from this chat and play our game. Now, are we calling this one the bottomless pit game? That's a good idea. Well, it is inspired by your podcast, James, which we will talk about in the second half of the show. But I thought this was appropriate. As you guys are the bottomless pit podcast, you will talk about anything. So we're going to put that to the test. <laughs> Can you and we talk about anything? So we've all picked a random topic for each other and we have a minute to talk about that topic straight. We can't hesitate and we just got to see who's the best at chatting shit, to be honest. So yes, no hesitating, like you said, Nick, but also no repeating. So no repetition for this so I've got my I've got two subjects obviously for each of you and one of them is really embarrassing well it could be really embarrassing I don't know who one to give it to because if I give it to Nick that's kind of embarrassing myself <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know I don't know whether to be cruel and give it to James anyway who wants to go first should we uh, kindly let our guest go first <laughs> you knew that was coming so uh, yeah Amy do you want to give James your topic for him uh, yeah, I'm going to be kind to you, actually. I'm going to give you the other one. So um, mountaineering. You've got one minute. Talk about mountaineering. Well, it's a good job you mentioned mountaineering because that is the one thing that I'm a specialist at. I'm, I'm really not. <laughs> the thing about mountaineering is it's very hilly and it's very tiring. <laughs> and I've, I've been on an eight-day hike in the Andes of Patagonia once. Uh, and it was just camping out every night going up over mountain passes looking at glaciers and glacial lakes and staying just out in the wild and i remember the first night we did that we actually got attacked not attacked but uh, almost a close encounter with a puma we had our bag we had a tent with like a porch to the tent and we had our bags inside that porch and we were inside the tent sleeping i was right by the tent door and i woke up and to hear this big thud and then a dragging noise it was really strange and found that the next day that one of the bags had been torn out of the tent and it had big tooth marks in it. We asked Whoa. the ranger what it might have been and they said it was a puma. And oh. that is time up now. <laughs> that was good. Man, you're like, um, well, it's lucky for you, I guess, not framed, but lucky that you kind of, you, you have done, you've had an experience. All you had to do was talk about a story when you almost saw a puma. <laughs> about halfway through, I completely forgot we were in a game there and I was just, <laughs> just locked into listening to this story. That was amazing. You really, you really went for it there. Okay, uh, Nick, do you want to go next? I think James should give you a subject. Okay, go for it. All right, Nick, you're going to love this one. I want you to talk for a minute about the things you love the most about Sheffield United. Oh, what? Okay, time, let's go. Um, okay, well, you're saying that ironically. For people that don't get it, 
I support Sheffield Wednesday for a football team in Sheffield in England, but their arch rivals are Sheffield United. What do I like about them? Um, I like the f- actually this is true. I like the fact that for every hero you need an enemy. Superman would be no one without who was his enemy? Um, Lex Luthor. Lex Luthor, exactly. You need your enemy, and then the worse they look, the better you look. And without your enemy, what are you? You know, you can't. <laughs> what is good without evil? So that's the way I see them. So I love them for that, that they make my team look good. We play in blue and white. That seems like pure, nice, friendly colours. They play in dirty red and white. We nickname them the pigs for red and white. It's like a ration of bacon. They are very inventive with their nickname and they call us the pigs because they can't think of anything else to call us. And I'm sorry if there are any Sheffield United fans listening. I'm not really that tribal about football. I love all you guys. You're great. And that's it. That's tough. Well I'm, done. I'm actually going to say you kind of failed with that. You're now rolling across the floor, but I think you failed because your topic was what you love about Sheffield Wednesday, uh, Sheffield United, sorry, and you never said anything. You were saying they were pigs. I said I love the fact that you know they're there, they exist to make us look good. So that's what I love about them. Mm. You also said about their dirty red uniforms. I'm not sure that that <laughs> yeah. consists of love. I'm going to say that Nick has failed this one. <laughs> I failed, but it was a good effort, right? No. No, because you failed. <laughs> so, um, Okay, I hate to say it, but I think it's my turn now. Okay, so I'm going to give Amy a subject now. So, Amy, can you talk for one minute about this topic? Should humans be eating wheat? Ah, okay. I can do this. This is fine. So recently I have found out that uh, I'm gluten free. Oh, it's really nerve- oh, it's nerve wracking when you put it in front of me at the time. Um, yeah, so I've now gone gluten free and I don't believe we should be eating wheat because all the wheat that we produce has been manipulated. And I have a scientist in front of me and I'm hoping he doesn't know much about the subject. Um, but yeah, it's been manipulated. It's had a lot of chemicals on it. And now our intestines cannot digest gluten so that's where wheat comes from Uh, no sorry gluten comes from wheat so I did not expect this subject at all um my mind's going blank so we can't digest it so we shouldn't be eating it that's pretty much the simple reason there um for example when I eat it I become very bloated I'm sure a lot of you want to know this Um, so I eat rice flour instead and it's fine. Tastes a little bit different, but it's fine. And it's down a minute. <laughs> well done. It's tough, isn't it? I learned a lot though. <laughs> well, yeah, I knew Amy would be able to go on a, a little rant about it. Um, but yeah, well done. Very good. Okay. So second round, Nick, I have left the embarrassing one for you. <laughs> okay. So this subject is a little bit embarrassing because it will reveal things about our relationship a little bit. Okay, I would like you to talk for one minute about pet names. Okay, pet names. Oh my God. So let's face it, all couples have them. They might be embarrassing. I might sometimes refer to Amy as some sort of little baby animal. You know, whether it be a a puppy or a a pigeon (laughs) or a kitten or whatever, a a pussy, you know. (laughs) Um, and yeah, it's just a bit of fun. It's not for anyone else to hear. You certainly shouldn't be saying it on a podcast, uh, which could be broadcasted all around the world. And you have names for me as well. Uh, what you you call me, Mister Big Penis, sometimes. <laughs> and, That's a lie. <laughs> and you know, just cute little pet names. You know, you know, little Mister Big Penis. And <laughs> we're at forty-eight seconds. This is the longest minute of my life. Um, but you know, little. Oh, that's it. No, little penis. No, little one. That's it. That's Amy, Amy's nickname, and she calls me Big One for obvious reasons. And that's time. <laughs> oh my God, that was horrible. Okay, see, this is yeah. That's why I didn't know whether. Are you glad I didn't give that one to you, James? Yeah, for the people listening, as soon as you revealed that topic, I wiped the sweat from my brow in relief. <laughs> that would have been horrific. I thought it'd be nice to you and evil to Nick. Uh, right, so Nick, you need to give James a subject. Okay, James, here we go. I'd like you to talk for one minute about feminism. Feminism. Okay, well, it's about... I th- oh, God, I'm going to... This This could go so wrong. <laughs> I'm going to try and tell you what I think feminism is. <laughs> and with my girlfriend sitting here next to me, because I know I've spoken to her about it before, this could go very wrong. But essentially, 
it's tied to things like women's rights. It's tied to things like equality for women. And it's tied to things like not suppressing, you know, the fairer sex, that kind of stuff. So we're talking about equal pay, equal opportunities for all different kinds of things, whether it's in the job, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's just in life in general, about not having to walk down the street and have, you know, builders whistle at you while you're walking down the street. Although I would like to say, there's no reason why they can't do that for us men too. And I do feel a little bit judged when they don't do it for me. So yes, I'll just put equality. that out there. <laughs> but I think just for the last few seconds, I would like to say that is my conclusion for what <laughs> I think of feminism. <laughs> That's it. Well done. Pretty good effort. I like how you always finish on the time as well. You're, you're watching it like a DJ when they have the intro to the song. You just kind of talk down to it. No, it's good. Okay, I think it's me. I'm the last one now. So, James, uh, please give me my minute subject. Your minute subject is escape rooms. Nice. Okay, I can talk about this. I've done four escape rooms in my life. My first one was actually in Budapest on a Hindu and I was severely hungover from a night out where I didn't get in till six in the morning. So I do not recommend doing escape rooms with a hangover. So what it is, is you go into a room and you're locked in and you have to solve a series of clues to get you to the end. They, most of them have a theme. So the last one I did was Egyptian theme. All of the floor was made with sand and um, we had to kind of find the Sphinx, which was kind of the thing you had to do by the end of it. And you go around finding clues and it's so fun. I turn into the bossiest person you've ever met in your life as soon as I get in there. I did the Egyptian themed one with my colleagues and um, I turned into a different person. Normally at work, I'm quite shy when boss, boss anyone around. And then I was like, move out the way, go over there, do this. Um, so that era is escape rooms. Minute up. Yeah. Fantastic. Well done. Time up. Whoa. I don't know about you guys, but I'm exhausted and it was fun, but I'm glad that's over. Right. So that was our game. Uh, if you've been listening to this episode, you know we have been talking about Luxembourg. So, James, I'm interested to know do they have their own royal family? Yes, they do. The official name of the country is actually the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, if you want to get technical. And that is because their version of a president or a king or or whatever you want to call it, the head of state, is the Grand Duke. And he has his palace right in the centre of Luxembourg City. And you might be thinking, well, so does the Queen of England right there in London at Buckingham Palace. But if you've ever been to Buckingham Palace, you know you can only get as far as the gate and you're kind of a good hundred metres away from the building. No, the palace in Luxembourg is on one of the main streets you can just be walking down going shopping turn right and the door to the palace is right there in front of you there's a couple of military guards standing outside it you can't walk inside but that's it you you can walk right up to the door of the grand duke and one time i was actually walking through the center of the city just minding my own business and there was a crowd of asian tourists just around the entrance to the to the palace And I thought, what's going on here? They're clearly waiting for something. So I just hung around for a little bit and the Grand Duke came out in his car and he was going somewhere. But I actually got to see the Grand Duke. And after 20 odd years of living in England, I've never seen the Queen. No, no, neither have I. Actually, she's been here, but we we didn't actually see her. And that's interesting. So does he have kind of bouncers around him? (laughs) I mean, yeah, like any kind of... security. Yeah, like any kind of head of state or even a celebrity, he has his kind of entourage of big men in in black suits and dark glasses, you know, looking after him. And he has soldiers outside his palace, you know, they're they're part of the Luxembourgish army and they march up and down outside the front door. But there's not a lot stopping you from running inside if you wanted to. Yeah, just so different from what we're used to. And a lot of people listening in America, where you know, security is so tight. That's interesting to hear. Now, sticking on the subject of the Grand Duke, his birthday, which is on the 23rd of June. That's a national holiday, right? So what happens that day? That's right. They have a huge street party, a massive festival. And unfortunately for me, I moved out of Luxembourg on the 21st of June. So I just missed it. But it's a huge street party. It's a massive festival. Everybody gets involved. It's, I guess you could compare it a little bit like a mini carnival in Rio kind of thing. The whole country gets involved. Everyone comes out, street food, music everywhere. It's just meant to be a wonderful, wonderful time. Nice. So I'm guessing everybody has the day of work as well. Because I think when the Queen's birthday, because in England, I don't know whether other countries know this, but she has two birthdays. She has an official and unofficial birthday. Um, but we don't have the day off work, do we? No, I don't think so. But in Luxembourg, it is a national holiday. Everyone gets the, the day off. 
So basically we need to start a campaign to get the same thing to happen here in the UK and we get two days off a year and two big parties. I, I think, think that's that the only conclusion we can make from this episode. So James, yeah, we'll, we'll wrap up this chat um, about Luxembourg, but tell us about uh, your own podcast. What do you guys uh, do and uh, talk about? Yeah, so it's called the Bottomless Pit Podcast. I host it with a friend of mine called Foley. He's an Irish guy who lives in Canada. And first and foremost, it's a way for us just to keep in touch and catch up with what we're doing, you know, and chat to each other while we're on opposite sides of the Atlantic. But we went traveling together a few years ago in South America and for those long bus journeys, as you know, there's there's a lot of hours to kill. And we kind of got into podcasts and just listening to podcasts and thought, we could do this. And we thought we'd just decide one day to maybe make a podcast about our travels. Um, but we didn't think we had enough stories to make a podcast purely about traveling. And so we wanted to leave it open to anything. And we called it The Bottomless Pit, with the name kind of suggesting that it's there's an endless amount of topics that we can talk about. But to keep it relevant to this podcast, fans of What The Foe might find our travel episodes interesting. And because that is mine and my co-host's main common interest, a lot of the episodes do centre around travel. So we've got stuff from South America, North America, road trips in Europe and Canada, everywhere. So if you guys want to check us out, it's the Bottomless Pit podcast. Wherever you find podcasts, there's a, we have a green and black logo uh, or we are at the BP podcast on all the socials. And I've said on a previous episode, I am a fan. I do listen. I really do. I'm not saying that just because you're in front of me. It's true. <laughs> I, I really enjoy the chat that you guys have. It's like you're having a Skype chat with each other. You're catching up. You're telling some funny stories. And we can all listen in, basically. And you do have some crazy stories. And one, for example, just tell us briefly about, did you, you stayed or like, I, I guess you couch surfed with an Irish nun in <laughs> Argentina or somewhere in Patagonia, didn't you? Yeah, it was in Chile, actually. So that, that, was a, that was a whole thing. That came out of nowhere, to be honest. So me and Foley had both lost our bank cards, which had our budget on for travel. Now, I had read somewhere online before I traveled that it's a good idea to split your money into different bank accounts so that if you do lose one, you've got another one to get you at least somewhere to get more money. So I had one card left after losing my first one, and then Foley lost his. So we were using half of my budget to fund two people. So we were in pretty dire straits, to be honest. And Foley was asking back home whether his his mum knew anyone in South America that he could send a replacement card out to and she's like well I think there was a nun who <laughs> left the country 25 years ago and moved to Chile I think she's still there and so this this nun she's from Ireland got got an email from Foley's mother and and she was still in Chile in this tiny tiny village of maybe 600 people only in the middle of nowhere in Chile and we went and stayed with her for a week it was it was the, it was the most authentic South American experience that I had, and it came courtesy of an Irish mother and a nun. <laughs> it is strange that the Irish do have links to all around the world, don't they? It's nuts. Yeah, I mean, we were in the most well. We celebrated St Patrick's Day in the most southern Irish bar in the world, in Ushuaia and Tierra del Fuego in Argentina, and we walked into an Irish pub because Foley really wanted to have a lot of Guinness on I on, on Paddy's Day. And there were, it was full of Irish people. And now you might think, well, that's not so surprising in an Irish pub. We were at the most southern place it's possible to be in the world without reaching Antarctica. And we couldn't move for Irish people. It was, it was ridiculous. And there was a couple of times, and it's also, you, Irish people all seem to know each other through sort of less than six degrees of separation. You know, you hear that six degrees of separation to everybody. In Ireland, it's like two. <laughs> you know, for example, we were in Boston and there was a pub that we walked by called uh, the hillside and Foley said oh, I've got to go in there my childhood street that I grew up on was called the hillside so we'll go in there and have a drink so he grew up in Ireland this is in Boston in the US we walk in it's owned by an Irish guy and so Foley gets chatting to him finds out that this guy knows Foley's uncle and the name hillside for that <laughs> pub actually came from the street that Foley grew up on wow it's mad, isn't it? It is crazy. So yeah, for for more you know good chat like that and good stories, then yeah, check out the Bottomless Pit podcast. Now there's only one thing left to do. Can you rate Luxembourg out of ten? So ten being the best place you've ever been, and one being the worst. Where does Luxembourg <laughs> sit? I'm not one for giving perfect marks, so I, I'm going to give it. I'm going to give it a solid eight. I think. Wow, that's a very good score. Yeah. And why why eight? I give it eight because it's 
so accessible. It's so it's actually surprisingly cheap to get to as well, believe it or not. If you actually look for flights, it's very easy to get to. You're within a couple of hours of really major international cities, Brussels, Frankfurt, Paris. They're not that far away. So you it's really easy to get around and see different things. There's tons to do there. It's beautiful architecture, beautiful landscape if you're into that kind of thing. Loads of World War II history, as I've mentioned. And the only reason it doesn't get the top marks is because it is kind of isolated. And I was there for six months and there were, you know, I'd done it all kind of thing. But that's not a slight against the country. It's a great place to visit, 100%. Lovely. Now, Nick, would you say he's um, persuaded you to go? Is it somewhere you'd look at? Definitely, yeah. It's more so than when we started recording, so you have achieved your aim, <laughs> which is great. Because, yeah, before I just thought it was a place where there are lots of banks. And, yeah, it di- didn't really appeal to me. And, you know, I didn't know of anything that was Luxembourgish. You know, what is their culture? You know, wh- why am I going there? But from what you've said, it sounds like a really nice place. And, you know, we're, we're travellers. We want to explore everywhere, don't we? So the fact that we've had someone, you know, give it such a good recommendation, absolutely, if we get the chance, I would really like to go to Luxembourg. Yeah, absolutely. Me too. And um, the main thing that draws me, just because I'm a bit of a dark tourist, is the uh, German side of the uh, memorials. I'd quite like to go there and, and see what it is from their side. Are there kind of like plaques up at, or like a museum building there that kind of tell the story of World War from their point of view? At the German cemetery? Mm. No, it's 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 really strange. The American cemetery is, is that. It's a tourist attraction. It's got all the information there. The German, the German soldier cemetery it's just a regular cemetery and it just happens to be where 10,000 German soldiers are buried. It's, it's, really, it's, it's really quite poignant, actually. It was more powerful for me going there, having no information on the walls or anything and just looking at what it was than going to the American cemetery, which was all, you know, dolled up. It was really clean, pristine and purely for tourists. And it has loads of information there, but the German cemetery was, was a lot more hard hitting I think. yeah yeah so i'm really interested in in going there and also seeing these lifts that take you from like the top level to the bottom level that sounds quite interesting so yeah you've persuaded me as well i think i would definitely make my way to luxembourg well we need to anyway because we want to hit every country in the world so we've got to go there at some point but i think you've bumped it up the list wonderful so that'll bring us to an end. So thank you very much, James, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. No, you're, you're welcome. Yeah, thanks for coming on. That'll bring us to the end of this episode. Now, we are officially, it's up and running. We are now on Patreon. So actually, we're now recording this at home in the UK, but by the time it gets into all you listeners' ears, we're travelling. We're full-time travelling now. We should, unless, unless the plan goes completely wrong, we should be in Greece by now, I think. But we are travelling and we are on Patreon. We've got that all set up. We've mentioned it before, but basically that is the best way you guys can contribute to the show and help us do more. There will be rewards and extra incentives for people that do want to become a patron of the show. But you can find all that details on our website. So we'll see you again next time on What The Faux Travel Podcast. <laughs>